Hello and welcome back to chapter 10. Today we're going to look at section 10.8 which deals with graphs of polar equations. So let's go ahead and start off with example 1. It says to sketch the graph of the polar equation r equals 4 sine theta. Now back when we were graphing rectangular equations um, we would make a table with x's and y's, come up with some coordinate points, and then plot those. We're going to do the same thing with example 1. Okay, except now we're dealing with r's and thetas. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm, I've created a table of theta values, as you can see right here. And then we're going to go ahead and solve for r at each one of those theta values. So when I plug a 0 in, the sine of 0 times 4 is 0. When I plug in pi over 6, the sine of pi over 6 is 1 half, and I multiply that by 4, and we get 2. When I plug in pi over 3, we end up with 2 square roots of 3. And I'm simplifying these, and if you need to see the work, please come see me. When I plug in pi over 2, I end up with 4. When we plug in 2 pi over 3, we end up with 2 square roots of 3. When we plug in 5 pi over 6, we end up with 2. When we plug in pi, we get 0. At 7 pi over 6, we get negative 2. At 3 pi over 2, we get a negative 4. At 11 pi over 6, we get a negative 2. And at 2 pi, we get 0. So now I'm going to go ahead and plot all of these points. And I'm going to start out at uh, theta equals 0, r equals 0. So that will be right here at the origin. Then I'm going to jump to my r value of 2 at pi over 6. And this line right here is pi over 6, if you recall. So I'm going to go out to 2, up to pi over 6, which is this point. And then another easy point would be uh, let's see, it looks like pi over 2 and 4, so that's going to be right here, and I've got a point in between at pi over 3, so pi over 3 is going to occur somewhere around here, and I'm going to do the same thing for 2 pi over 3, it looks like I'm going to have something around here, 5 pi over 6 gives me a radius of 2, so that's this point here. At pi, I'm right back at 0. So if I go and I connect these points, I see that I have something that should look kind of like a circle. Now, you can also use the polar mode of your calculator to graph these. And if you have trouble with that, I'll show you how to do this in class. Just as with rectangular curves, sometimes it's easier or more convenient to only plot half the points if we know that some type of symmetry is involved. Now the same case is true when we are dealing with polar equations. Now if we look back at example 1, we saw that it was symmetric with respect to the line theta equals pi over 2. Now we know that because when we look at the line theta equals pi over 2, that was the center or the axis of symmetry for our curve. Now we do have a few other axis of symmetries and if you look at these, the first graph here, this is the scenario that we had in example one where all we have to do is take our point, r theta, and reflect it over pi over two and we can either do that by changing the sign of both r and theta or we can change leave r alone and subtract theta from pi. And in the middle here, we have an axis of symmetry with respect to the polar axis. And if you remember, the polar axis is kind of like the x-axis. So in order to find the new points of something that's rotated over the polar axis, we would take our r theta value and either just change the sine of theta, so it becomes r negative theta, or we would change the value, the sine of r, and take our theta value and go pi minus theta. And then the third case we have deals with symmetry um, with respect to the pole. Okay, and the pole is really like the origin, if you recall. And what we're going to do is we're going to either take our point r theta 
and keep r the same but add pi to the theta value, or we can take just the opposite sign of r and keep our theta value the same. Now, just as a summary, okay, if, if some tests for symmetry and polar coordinates, these are kind of a summary of what was on the last slide there, okay? We're going to start out with our r theta value first, and to find out if it is reflected over the line theta equals pi over 2, I can go ahead and keep the r value the same and subtract, or take pi and subtract theta from it. And if that point lies on the curve, then I know it's been reflected. Or I can change the sign of both r and theta, and if it gives me the new point or the point on the curve, then I know that it was reflected over the line theta equals pi over 2 as well. And that's going to hold true for both the polar axis and the pole. And I'll show you how to do this in the next example. Okay, so example two says to use symmetry to sketch the graph of r equals 3 plus 2 cosine theta. Now, if I'm going to start out looking at the line theta equals pi over 2, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my original point r theta and change it so that it becomes a negative r negative theta. Now if that gives me the same result as my original equation, then I know I have a graph that's symmetric with respect to the line theta equals pi over 2. Now when I go to plug these into my original equation, that gives me a negative r is equal to 3 plus 2 times a cosine of a negative theta. Well a negative theta, if you recall, is going to bring me down in this direction. So if, let's just pick some arbitrary point, let's say the cosine of pi over 4, which occurs right here, that's going to have the same sign value as in terms of positive or negative as the value of cosine of a negative pi over 4. Because in this part of my coordinate system, my cosine values are always positive, whether it be in quadrant 1 or quadrant 4. So in this case, it doesn't change the sign of that. So I really have a negative r is equal to 3 plus 2 cosine of theta. Now, I just generated a new equation because this equation here is different than the one I started out with. So that tells me that it's not symmetric with respect to the line theta equals pi over 2. So now I'm going to have to try again. So this time, let's try the polar axis, and if you remember, the polar axis means I'm going to use um, the point r theta and switch it to r negative theta. So if I plug in r negative theta, and I'm going to do this off to the side here, my r value stays the same, and now I'm going to go 3 plus the cosine of a negative theta. Well, we just talked about that if I take and change the sign of cosine, I'm sorry, the sign of the value of cosine, it's still going to be the same thing as a positive cosine. So I still have r equals 3 plus the cosine of theta. And there should be 2's in there, I apologize. So because this equation here is the same equation as this, I know that I have symmetry with respect to the polar axis, so I only have to do part of the point, and then I can reflect everything else over the polar axis. So, I've already created a table here with theta values, and when I go to plug these in, um, when we plug in 0 for r, we end up with 5. If I plug in pi over 3, we get 4, then 3, 2, and 1. So now I have points I can plot. So at 0, I have 5, which is going to be this point here. At pi over 3, I have 4, so I've got this. At pi over 2, I have 3, which is right here. Then we have 2 pi over 3, which is 2. So that's going to occur about here. And at pi, I have a radius of 1. So my curve is going to look something like this, and we're going to come all the way in 
to the point one or where I have a radius of one and a theta value equal to zero. So something like that. And then because it is we are able to reflect it over the pole or the polar axis, which is like your x-axis, I can then go ahead and reflect these points and get something oops, that looks like this here, except a little bit neater. And again, you can do this on your calculator. Now the next thing we're going to look at are special polar graphs. And this list of graphs can be found on page 789 of your textbook. You are not required to memorize them. However, there's a few things I would like you to make note of. The first type is called a limicon, okay, and that can be found right here. And the general formula for those are going to be by taking a plus or minus b cosine theta or a plus or minus b sine theta. And you can see that these are the different scenarios right here that would give you the different types of limicons. And for the rose curves, which are found in the middle section here, these are found, um, or the number of petals, which each loop is considered a petal. You have n petals if n is an odd number. If n is an even number, you'll have two times that number or twice as many petals. So for our last example, it says based on the equation, tell what type of curve is going to be generated. And if we look at part A, it says that we have three cosine of three theta. This follows the general formula of a rose curve. And because this number, n, right there, is actually an odd number, I know that I will have three petals. And if you graph this, you'll actually end up with something that looks like this. And again, please test these out in your graphing calculator. Now for part B, we have r squared equals 4 cosine 2 theta. So this looks like the lemniscati. And this, when we graph it, is going to be something like this. And that concludes section 10.8. Today's fun fact comes from kidsmathgamesonline.com. Can you list the smallest 10 prime numbers? And I'll give you, why don't you put the video on pause, try to figure them out, and then we'll go over them here in a second. Okay, they are 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19, 23, and 29. Now of these, 2 and 5 are the only prime numbers that end with a 2 or 5. And one last fact, what comes after a million, billion, and trillion? The answer is a quadrillion, quintillion, sextillion, septillion, octillion, nonillion, decillion, and undecillion. So those are your fun facts for tonight. We'll see you guys tomorrow.